Thank you, Thorfinnur. I'm uh, very ha happy to be here with you today. I hope everyone can hear me in the room and uh, at home behind your screens or in the office. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you today in the EFTA house. It's the house of the EEA agreement and it brings all the uh, organizations of the EFTA family together under one roof, except of course the EFTA court, which has to keep its distances from the political things going on in Brussels and they are in Luxembourg. So you'll be hearing all of four on that. So my name is uh, Melpo Josefides and I'm the director uh, uh, of the Legal and Executive Affairs Department at ESA. Um, you will have gathered that we're not the European Space Agency, so I don't promise to take you to the moon and back today. Um, but I do promise that uh, when we go through this presentation, you will recognize the reflection of the stars of the European flag. And that's because uh, ESA resembles the European Commission. And uh, yeah, we uh, basically do the same job as the European Commission on, in the EFTA pillar. So this morning you heard about how EEA law is uh, incorporated, how it becomes uh, part of the EEA agreement. And this afternoon we're talking about implementation. So how the agreement is enforced. I will speak about the role of ESA and Olafur will be speaking to you about the role of the EFTA court. Very quickly, what is the EEA agreement about? Uh, the core of the EEA agreement is this extension of the internal market to the three EEA EFTA states, which brings uh, the benefits like the four freedoms, persons, goods, services and capital, and also fair competition and environmental worker and consumer protection to citizens and businesses all over Europe. So in the EFTA pillar, the mandate of ESA, our responsibility, our task, is to ensure that there is compliance in the three states with EEA law. So for the lawyers in the room or those who are interested in the architecture of the institutions, you will see that um, the role of ESA and the EFTA court, by the way, is rooted in um, the EEA agreement, which is an agreement which brings together both the EFTA side and the EU side in one single international agreement. But the precise mandate and the procedures we follow, all of that is found in the surveillance and court agreement, which is an agreement which is only decided by the three EEA EFTA states. So the existence of ESA is due to an agreement with the EU, but how we function is to be found in an agreement between the three EEA EFTA states. This slide you will have seen many times before and also this morning, but I still want to show it because I think it's very telling also in terms of this uh, two pillar structure and the, the role of uh, where ESA sits. Um, as you see, the EFTA court sits opposite the Court of Justice of the European Union. So that's the reflection there, uh, the EFTA pillar on one side and the EU institutions on the other side. And ESA sits opposite the European Commission, as I was telling you before. So like the European Commission, of whom we are a bit the mirror, our role at ESA is to um, do the, uh, the responsibility of compliance in monitoring and enforcing uh, European law. So if the Commission is the guardian of the treaties on the EU side, that's what's in the EU treaties, at ESA we are the guardians of the EEA agreement in the three EEA EFTA states. We don't have a legislative role like the Commission, that is taken care of by the EFTA Secretariat and the states themselves. So uh, we don't have a legislative role to play, but we have all the surveillance responsibilities that the Commission has. And um, it is very uh, interesting to note also that the EFTA pillar is a self-policing one, meaning that there is no interference directly in our institutions in the EFTA pillar from the EU side. So there is no participation in the decision making in, on the EFTA side by anyone coming from the EU. And uh, the fact that the EFTA pillar is self-policing, that it relies on ESA and the EFTA court to make sure that EEA law is applied, means that we have a special responsibility to have these rules uh, enforced in the EEA EFTA states 
and that responsibility go back, goes back to the credibility of the EEA agreements. So the willingness of the EU to have such an agreement in place, I think it, if it were tested today, would not have been the same as in the 19s when this was decided. And the, one of the reasons why it is still ongoing and functioning well is this trust that the EU has that the self-policing mechanisms on the EFTA side uh, work well. So ESA checking the compliance and the court uh, overseeing ESA's decisions. So how do we decide in ESA? We have a new college since the 1st of, of January, um, three members. Each uh, member is nominated by their own uh, country, but they are appointed uh, by the three states together. And it is our colleagues in the EFTA Secretariat who take care of the appointment decision. So uh, what you do in this house impacts ESA in, uh, in many ways. So college members sit for a four year term and um, their appointment can be renewed uh, more than one times. And together they are responsible for uh, every decision which ESA makes in the course of its mandate to ensure the compliance with the EEA agreement. So our president, uh, Arne Rexon from Norway, has a career in governance and public policy. For those of you in the room, he's sitting just uh, here next to Hege. Stefan Bariga is uh, the person on the right on the photos. He's from Liechtenstein and he had joined the previous college in October last year. He has a career in diplomacy. And uh, SS College is complemented by Ardi Park Arnason, and I hope I pronounce it correctly, who is from Iceland and who comes from politics. So between them, um, our college have a very diverse mix of, of profiles, uh, bringing different uh, career paths together. And uh, with their careers and their uh, deep knowledge of uh, their countries, uh, they bring that those different perspectives into the decision making, um, which is collective. So there are areas of responsibility in our college. Uh, They're not divided uh, along uh, country lines. So uh, the Icelandic college member Arni Palk is not responsible for Iceland, rather uh, their responsibilities are divided along uh, portfolios. So for example, Arni Park is our college member who is responsible for competition and also things like food safety. Stefan uh, deals with uh, free movement of persons and uh, Arne is responsible for state aid. These are just examples. In practice, uh, because of the collegiate responsibility for decisions of ESA, college sit together and take their decisions collectively. That's called collegiality and it's written in our rules of procedure and it's a very important uh, principle to ensure that uh, ESA is a strong institution that makes um, good decisions. Under the responsibility of uh, college, um, the work is done by a great team of roughly 70 staff members plus our trainees. And uh, if you compare that to the 32,000 commission staff members, you'll see um, the difference. Of course, the difference is justified by the fact that we don't have a legislative role, uh, but still I find the numbers quite striking. About half of the staff are from the EA EFTA states and we have at the moment, I think, 20 nationalities represented. So we're not a big organization, we're not a large organization, but our mandate is pretty big. Um, we are an institution that takes care of its staff. There is a very high level of uh, satisfaction among our staff members. And I can say that since I joined ESA in July last year, I feel it in uh, every decision that we're making, that there is, uh, um, we have a, an organization that cares for its staff, for its well-being, and uh, gets the best out of, uh, of the professionals uh, who are around. Many of the staff members left their countries and moved with their families or alone to be here and COVID has not been easy. But along the way, there has always been um, this uh, connection among people, whether in the office or remotely, uh, to make sure that everyone feels uh, well and has, um, if not a family, at least a support system here in Brussels. And I think that's uh, very important. Uh, because that's the conditions for which people uh, can give their best. ESA is also an institution that values uh, diversity and we are very proud of the percentage of uh, women in, in management. 
you have four different departments, so two directorates, which like the Commission DGs are responsible for conducting case handling and investigating possible infringements, preparing decisions for college. And um, we have our, my department, the Legal and Executive Affairs Department, which acts as the legal service on the one hand, so advising on future college decisions, preparing them, uh, checking that they're legally sound, and also conducting litigation, which I will be talking about later on. Apart from that, we also provide executive support to college, a bit like the Secretariat General of the Commission. And this part of the department uh, houses the communications team, the registry and the data protection officer. Because at ESSA we apply the data protection rules um, in the same way as the EU and we are under the supervision of the European Data Protection Supervisor. So the two directorates and uh, the Legal and Executive Affairs Department, we are responsible that, for ensuring that ESA carries out its activities in monitoring the states and ensuring that they comply with their obligations. So what are the obligations of uh, the states that we check compliance of? Well, first is to have the law. You've heard how EU laws become part of the EEA agreement once that is done then the states need to incorporate it into national legislation. So the first thing that our colleagues in the internal market directorate do is check that that legislation at the national level has been passed. Then the second obligation is of course to have the right law. That means that the national legislation has to um, correctly implement the EEA legislation that became part of um, the EEA agreement. And that's, of course, a more delicate exercise to do, and it is impossible on an everyday basis to uh, control every single line of all the national legislation implementing that. The other part of the EEA EFTA state's obligations is actually what is closer to people, and it's making sure that the law is applied correctly in practice so that people and businesses can actually enforce their their rights because the administration um, applies the laws at, as they should. So these are the obligations of the states for which as ESA we are responsible in um, checking that they are compliant with the EEA agreement. So this slide is about the first obligation, have the law. And it shows how many um, pieces of legislation that have become part of the EA agreement um, are not yet uh, incorporated, are not yet implemented at state level. One figure to remember uh, or to take away from this is um, that the average transposition deficit for directives increased from 0.8% to 0.9% since the December 2020 scoreboard. And at least, and now all three member states actually have at least one directive, which has been outstanding for more than two years. So this deficit is actually very telling about the amount of work that we do at ESA, because as long as the laws have not been incorporated uh, nationally, and I'm thinking especially about Norway and Iceland, uh, because Liechtenstein is a bit of a, in an easier position. They only have to implement directives. Regulations apply automatically and they don't need to uh, take any legislation nationally because of how their constitution is uh, drafted as a as a monist system. So um, this deficit over time is just extra work for ESA because we have to keep monitoring if it has been done. It's a checklist that keeps um, being long and uh, that requires a lot of time and energy from our colleagues in AIMA to uh, encourage the states and have this dialogue with them to, um, uh, uh, to make them pass the laws. But of course, the responsibility for complying with uh, their obligations under the EA agreement is a state's responsibility. Um, our responsibility is to check that they do it, but it is ultimately the responsibility of, of the states to actually pass the legislation. So what tools do we have as ESA to uh, bring compliance, to make sure that uh, EA law becomes a reality for people on the ground and that the right laws are in place? The first thing we do, of course, is monitor, as I said, first uh, looking at the situation uh, in, the, in the country, looking at the legislation, 
Um, sometimes uh, we uh, get information about these functionings from uh, reading the press, the national press. But we monitor the situation uh, in a systematic way for incorporation. Um, the other thing we do is investigate. When there is a suspicion that something is um, going wrong, that uh, the law has not been incorporated properly, or that it, uh, it is not applied correctly, then uh, we can open a case and uh, look into the matter. And when doing that, uh, we don't only speak to the state authorities, to the ministries who are responsible for that part of the legislation. Uh, they are, of course, our natural counterparts, and we do that. But we're also very open and listen to uh, what um, individual complainants or companies have to say or organized groups. We also conduct inspections and inspections is um, can be about uh, checking that the food and safety authorities in the states um, actually check that the food safety legislation is uh, applied correctly so that the food that is in people's plates all across the EEA is safe to eat. And we also do inspection when it comes to competition. So when there is a suspicion of uh, abuse of dominant uh, position, for example, um, ESA, like the Commission, has the, po the power to go into the private undertakings and ask for information and get what it needs to, to investigate. And the last uh, tool we have is, of course, uh, in case there is a breach of the competition rules, uh, fines to the undertakings for, for having breached those rules. And again, that's something that happens on the, on the Commission side as well. At the core of these tools are the infringements. So um, after monitoring an investigation, um, if it turns out that our suspicions were correct or that indeed it shows that there, were, there is a clear infringement going on, Again, either, either because the law is not correctly incorporated or because it's not applied as it should be, then uh, we can start infringement uh, actions. So, um, as I uh, explained before, anyone can file, a, we get the information from private individuals. So anyone can file a complaint. There is actually a, a, pa a page on our website where um, individuals can, can go and file a complaint and raise a matter to, the attention, to our attention. We also can take uh, the initiative to open a case to investigate an infringement. And in, in all cases, uh, we will have a formal investigation. So once this preparatory uh, stage has happened and the formal investigation shows that uh, there is, we think, we believe there is an infringement, then what we do is issue a letter of formal notice to the state, asking them to comply within a certain deadline and uh, explaining what we think needs to happen for uh, compliance, how to apply correctly the EEA law. The state has the opportunity to either comply or comply and send us a response to that letter in case there was, they think we misunderstood what is going on on the ground or the way they apply things. If we're still convinced there is a breach of EEA law, the second stage is a reasoned opinion. So that is the last stage where we have to have all our legal arguments together as to why there is a breach of EEA law. And we give a last chance to the state to explain themselves and justify um, what this, uh, the, the, their approach and how they apply EEA law. After the, we have to go through these two stages because um, in terms of a fair trial, the state needs to have had the opportunity to explain and defend its position if it's not in respect of, um, if it's not, if it is in breach of EEA law. After the recent opinion, the next step, if the infringement is still ongoing, is taking the matter to the EFTA court. So that materializes as an action of ESA against the state, asking the EFTA court to declare that there has, there has been a breach in, uh, in that state. So the picture is um, not very reassuring, very reassuring. At the moment, we have 212 uh, cases of infringements open. Uh, at ESA. These are not court cases, these are 
uh, administrative cases dealt with our by our colleagues uh, in uh, mainly in the internal market uh, directorate and these are cases that if uh, the if the compliance uh, doesn't come at a certain moment in time might have to reach the stage of the court and here I'd like to take a moment to say a couple of words about how uh, we feel about going to court um, with the states. And um, I want to say that we, uh, we think it's a very important tool, legal tool to bring compliance, but we always hope that at all of the stages that I described before, at the stage of the investigation even, or even at the stage of the letter from our notice or the reasoned opinion, we hope that the dialogue we have with the ministry will um, convince the, the state to change the approach and come into compliance with EEA law. So uh, infringements, when they reach the court case, it's really because we've tried everything and um, we don't see compliance coming or we have no hope that it will be coming anytime soon. We need to uh, fulfill our role and take uh, matters to the, to the next step. So I've talked to you about what is our main um, reason of existence as a compliance authority, as a surveillance authority, as ESA. Uh, and that's basically the work of our internal market directorate and um, in coordination, of course, with, with LIA under the responsibility of college. But apart from this compliance role, there is also um, a very big set of responsibility for ESA in the field of state aid and competition. So ESA uh, monitors state aid in the EEA, which means that the, the rules have come from the agreements. We are enforcers of the rules. EEA states uh, cannot grant state aid, that is the rule, and it has a lot of exceptions to it. So if um, those exceptions are set out in the agreement and there are guidelines of the Commission that we also take up in the EFTA pillar about cases where um, state aid would serve a superior interest and is not seen as uh, damaging competition across, uh, across the EEA. For example, for environmental um, projects, or uh, indeed for uh, aid during the pandemic. So all the assistance, uh, the financial assistance that's given by states during the pandemic to companies, all of that were of course the state decision to grant that aid, but it needed clearance from ESA because otherwise it would be unlawful, unlawful aid. The consequences of the aid being found to be unlawful are quite drastic because the state would then have the um, responsibility of recovering the unlawfully paid aid. And that's just the minimum you can do if, uh, if you have had aid that has distorted uh, the market. So on the competition uh, side of things, so um, whether companies uh, respect the level playing field and play by the rules and don't have agreements between themselves that um, uh, damage uh, competition between other undertakings. Um, all of that is also responsibility of ESA within the three EEA states. So we have our own uh, way of, uh, of dealing with this and these rules mirror completely again the EU side. I just want to say that uh, lately the main source of uh, work in that in the competition field has been uh, a case of uh, cases of abuse of dominant position more than uh, cartels and agreements between undertakings and the most um, known uh, case is uh, the fine that ESA has issued to Telenor for its uh, pricing strategy which had the effect of capturing an emerging market in the Norwegian telecom sector. This case is now before the EFTA court and we await the decision of the EFTA court and I expect Olafur not to want to comment on it. I also wanted to uh, spend some time to tell you about what has kept us busy in the past uh, months, not everything of course. Um, but to say a couple of words about uh, the areas in which SI is doing its part for tackling the challenges of the future. And um, I thought it would be good to speak about uh, climate and the green transition. So ESA has helped the states to uh, measure their land use to reach emission targets. We have approved tax breaks for electric vehicles. 
we've supported a massive project in sequestering carbon in liquid form under the sea. And we are very proud of the innovation that we are seeing in the EEA EFTA states, and we're happy to uh, support it as much as we can within our mandate. So before I start to uh, wrap up, um, a word about um, the last piece of the enforcement puzzle and uh, how SI is present at the courts. As I said before, our aim as SI is to, whenever possible, try to ensure that the EEA EFTA states comply with EEA law obligations without the need to uh, reach the level of the court case. But on occasion, ESA does go to court with uh, that direct action against the EFTA state. And in that case, it's uh, my department, the Legal and Executive Affairs, who handles the litigation. At the moment, we have 11 open cases before the courts, six at the EFTA court and five at the Court of Justice of the EU. Most of it are uh, cases of uh, advisory opinions and preliminary ruling references, of which Olafur will be telling you a bit more. Apart from the um, EFTA court, uh, we uh, also uh, appear before the Court of Justice of the EU. And uh, on occasion before uh, national courts where they have the amicus curiae procedure, which allows external um, interveners to, um, to become part of the proceedings. Since uh, December 20. 19, um, the Court of Justice of the EU reversed its previous uh, position. And since then, both ESA and the EA EFTA states have the right to participate in proceedings, in infringement proceedings in the EU pillar. So commission against France or Germany or Italy or Sweden, this kind of cases, which are about the same rules that we apply and enforce in our pillar, uh, as ESA and the, both ESA and our states have the right to intervene uh, before those cases. And that's something that is actually very encouraged on the EU side. So having arrived uh, for me at the subject of the EFTA court, I think it's a good moment for me to wrap up. And um, I hope you have noticed not only the reflections of uh, the stars of the European flag in my presentation, but also the stars in my eyes um, when I speak about the marvelous EEA agreement and EU law. Thank you.